Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And on behalf of Sotheby's, I'm thrilled to host today's Art Views conversation. I'm Nina Del Rio, Vice Chairman and Director of Sotheby's Advisory and Museum Services. And I'm really here to introduce my two friends and colleagues, Pauline Willis and Michael Govan. Um, I will say that I'm proud on behalf of Sotheby's that we've partnered with both of these extraordinary organizations, the AFA, American Federation of the Arts, and LACMA, Los, Ange Los Angeles County Museum of Art, for so many years. Um, Pauline is the CEO and director of AFA, where she's been in her position since 2012. And before that, she was deputy director and CFO. I'm, I'm also proud to say that she's increased supportive exhibitions from two to 20 during her tenure, which is a huge jump. Michael Govan is CEO and Wallace Annenberg Director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where he oversees both the collection and the 20 acre campus. I was reading in his bio today an incredibly impressive fact that the museum has acquired through do donation or purchase 56,000 objects during Michael's tenure, which is really um, such a wonderful accomplishment. But I'd like to turn it over to Michael and Pauline for today's conversation. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you so much for your support over these years and thanks to Sotheby's. Normally, we would be in person in New York City at uh, Sotheby's headquarters having this conversation. But needless to say, um, I look at Silver Linings. It's an opportunity to touch base with one of my favorite colleagues across the country, Michael Govan. Um, Michael and I tend to see each other at the AAMD conferences twice a year. Um, and catch you briefly um, over glasses of wine and so forth. So it's nice to be here with you, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, the West Coast. Good afternoon, East Coast. So welcome. Thank you, Pauline. It's really nice to be here. I wish we were in person, but that will happen someday soon again. We but hope. at least to have a chance to talk and see you. Yes. Good. And thanks, Nina. Yeah. yeah. So um, you, um, you guys have been closed. Latin has been closed since March. Right. And so I guess I still right in to ask, how's that been? How's that been for your operations? And how have you maintained your presence during this period of time? Because it's been quite some time. Yeah, it's been very difficult. We're we're um, we're the only major metropolitan art museum not open still. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Closed in March. It was very dramatic. We had exhibitions being installed. Uh, you know, we had Nara, uh, who had come from Japan and was three galleries into the show and had to go back. Uh, it was it was quite a dramatic event. And then because California, um, you know, they opened up too fast, numbers went up, and so there was a more draconian. Uh, plan put in place. And very sadly, when it was all done quickly. Um, it contradicted a lot of the local authorities approaches and museums by California standards were put in a very low category of opening. So it's been a, it's been a, that's one of my full-time occupations right now is to explain to California that um, museums are safer than retail and just as important, but that is not a, a view that's held by all, mm -hmm. even though, and the AAMD was very helpful in creating a quick survey to show that 2 million people have already visited art museums in places with more COVID than LA, not, um, and there's only so far one reported case um, through museums. And that's because our protocols, which a lot of those we developed very early on with LA County and city are working. And um, I'm on the regions of the Smithsonian, they're working. So mm -hmm. it's been incredibly frustrating to see California give such a low priority to museums. Um, and I, I have to say there, I think, as we all know, the those early days, so many of us know people in the art world who died and we lost so many friends. The tragedy uh, just has been huge. Um, and so it's been it's been so hard, as you know, economically and otherwise. I mean, I think it's safe to say it's always true that whatever doesn't kill you strengthens you. <laughs> and I do believe that a lot will come out of this. I mean, just a minor example is um, when we immediately had to close, of course, we're one of the largest in-school programs of any museum. And so immediately none of our teaching artists, of which we had a lot, could go could be in schools. And so the question is, what would they do if we were uh, continuing to pay them? And we did. Um, and so we 
we turned them all into taking their lessons and putting them on essentially on YouTube. <laughs> so they all became YouTubers, <laughs> quickly learning how to set up their iPhones. And so out of that, we have now have, we started releasing them weekly. We have a huge library of make art at home videos in seven languages. Um, so the kids and parents who are at home struggling uh, to be yeah. at home for all that time. And so people are really using them. So our entire education program has pivoted. Um, mm -hmm. and, and honestly, we had, we lamented what we were gonna do without our, our theater because we're under construction and had to tear down the theater. We're rebuilding a new one. Everybody was distraught. Um, when COVID hit, we started this series, um, it's called uh, Racism is a Public Health Issue, a series of symposia. There were uh, a few of them. The first one was related to the sort of anti-Asian racism that was emerging in the wake of COVID, this anti-Chinese, anti-Asian. And, uh, and over those, we've had thousands of people attend those. So our theater only held at the, on a good, you know, 600 people. So we have to rethink now if we have thousands that are plugging in that way, um, is that something to do in the future? So I, I, right. There has, as many people have said, there is good that will come out of this very tragic situation. But the longer we stay closed, of course, it's just so painful and so painful when it's unnecessary. Like if 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 California officials could just just see the data that's coming out nationally. Um, so we're working on that. Yeah, Michael, we, uh, as you know, reopened here in New York a couple of months ago. And I was I had a distinct pleasure of speaking with uh, Dan Weiss right on the eve of the opening of the Met, and they've successfully opened. And I think, I think what we've been doing across, um, across the country is watching the rising cases and adjusting accordingly. Yes. I was speaking to one of our colleagues in Denver, and as soon as they saw their cases on the rise, they reduced capacity from, I think, 33% to 20% and so forth. So there are ways to do this so that we can still get exposed to the art. So I, I could understand your frustration at not having those people coming in and the and so forth. It's so hard because it's also, it's everyone's reason for being, yeah. um, you know, it's just, it's just this long to be this long. I, I mean, education is part of that and we're able to do that virtually to a certain extent. But again, in the face of, of the fact that museums, as you know, because of all these protocols, because of our ability to manage the rules and the protocols to be flexible, um, we are really in a great position to just help with what's such a depressing situation. Mm -hmm. And that's when it just gets so hard for, it's been so hard for us. We're, we're going to mount a big campaign to hopefully, uh, there was a New York, there was an LA Times editorial last week, um, uh, just asking again, why retail stores, luxury goods stores would be open and commercial art galleries but not museums. Uh, and then there was actually a television news story. And I've talked to all our, you know, our joint friends, common friends in New York and Texas, you, you know, there it's actually, museums are a wonderful place to contribute okay. to this kind of desperate situation and also to the economy because it yeah. does help. It does help and it helps us with COVID fatigue, which we all have by now. Um, so, Michael, something that um, occurred to me is that you, you're in a unique position, LA, um, and you specifically, ACMA, because you are also in the middle or in the beginning of a massive construction project. I touched on it briefly. So how's that been? Um, and sort of where are you in the life of the project? I think your demolition just got completed. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are in the life of the project and how is COVID impacting that timeline? So yes, I think as a lot of people know, since it's been well publicized, it's been 20 years of effort by the board of trustees and the staff of uh, yeah. and, and our community to rebuild old LACMA because of the the buildings were, uh, we affectionately the staff called it LACMA because we had to send buckets out whenever it rained, but the seismic issues were the bigger issues. And so with the County of Los Angeles that owned the building did not want to restore them. And so they've, they set the task really for the board since before I got to LACMA that we have to rebuild those. That was part of the, I think my interest in, in this being one of the only big United States building projects on this scale. And, and it was not just to rebuild it, it was what it, would it mean to make a 21st century art museum. And we can talk about that, this uh, a museum that would um, deal with art in a completely different way, I think more equitably to use a word. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, just luckily, I, I, 
we finished the bulk of the fundraising with a major $50 million gift from the Keck Foundation last December. We moved out art, a lot, people, <laughs> important, mm -hmm. uh, and we're able to turn the site over to the contractors in, in March, actually, where we closed. So it's gone extremely well because, and there's been no COVID, no problems. And of course, because we weren't dealing with supply chain, chain issues or interior spaces, we were exactly on time, on budget. Uh, and it's an interesting thing that when we started the project pre-COVID, there was so much building going on that nobody cared. It was mm -hmm. like, whatever, there's too much building. It's even hard to get workers. Now that all of these other projects have been taken offline, this project will contribute 9,000 jobs and 1.2 billion to the economy, twice its budget in terms of contributions, economic impact. We had an economic impact statement done to, to, to the local economy. And you can imagine how much it means to every worker on that site now to have those jobs. Um, and so there's a kind of the whole project's been invested with a new meaning of, mm -hmm. of, of really having jobs and and at a really critical time when so many other projects have fallen off the radar so and 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 i think even the appreciation the 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 relationship with the county and the construction workers that we have close relationships with has has become more i think positively emotional in a great way so and i think the timing will be good because the building will be open in 24 and i think if you talk to experts based on what happened in 08 and then even in 9-11 it, it, tourism is really not going to come back until then um and 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 i think we 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 have a hundred thousand square feet open now if we can just get open <laughs> <laughs> and we're mostly local community anyway so we really feel we can serve our community in the interim right so tell me for for those of um for those watching who are not familiar with the site so you are you've um, demolished two or three buildings, and you still have. To, can you explain? The so the plan was um, when uh, I arrived in LA, I guess, fifteen years ago now. So the idea was to add on first, mm -hmm. and then go back and fix the old buildings. That way, when we were closed, I mean, who imagined we would actually close? But no one wanted to close the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for five years. So the idea was expand first. Right. We built two a hundred thousand square feet of space. The Broad Contemporary Art Museum and the Resnick Exhibition Pavilion so that we would stay open. We doubled our size, doubled our audience. Um, and then the idea was to replace um, four old buildings. We did restore, there's a famous pavilion by Bruce Goff, designed by Bruce Goff, Oklahoma architect, Japanese mm -hmm. uh, pavilion, That that that's being restored. But the other four buildings were determined to be beyond repair. And right. so we're replacing them with one singular new structure by, um, designed by Swiss architect Peter Zimtor. And it's a it's a very unique design. The idea was that the the main galleries would be lifted and a single floor. Um, mm -hmm. And it's an organic shape. It actually goes over Wilshire Boulevard. Um, to, so it's a, it's a very unique design. And then all the facilities allows for space through the park and this open air covered space. It's very COVID friendly. All the staircases are outside. And there's, uh, I think there's 100,000 square feet of covered space for outdoor events, films, lectures, mm -hmm. conversations, et cetera, restaurants. And then the idea of this main floor was, was with an organic shape, two entrances that it was, um, it had no front and as Peter Zimtor said, no back, no one culture in the front, one culture in the back. So it was specifically designed with this idea and it has glass all around that it would be transparent and open to the city. You look out, people look in, so you know it's a museum under unlike a stone wall that we had. Yeah. Uh, and that there is a, a, a arrangement of galleries that's regular throughout. So you can put anything anywhere. And so there's no hierarchy zero hierarchy of any culture and we know we knew that a fraction of the people went to see our southeast asian and indian collections on the fourth floor of the amundsen building versus the first two floors so we know there's a there's an implied hierarchy and access and the idea is everything was equally accessible and then the, the building was also designed that it could be easily rotated and obviously the museum of modern art has made that popular now but there there's this idea that if you're going to if you're going to address questions of systemic racism, of of colonialism, yeah. one of the only ways to do it is to show objects from different points of view in different conditions, so that you can show it from the point of view of the 
colonizer or the point of view of the colonized with one thing or another. And, and so this, the whole program for the building is going to be extremely unique. Um, curators have already put in, I think there's 226 proposals, mini proposals to organize it like a jigsaw puzzle for the first few years. And so it's been a, I want to say that part, people hunkered down and in video calls with curators, it's been a, a that's been a joyful process. Yeah. Rethinking art history from edge to edge with cross collaborations between departments, multi-generational. There are pro proposals, I think, that are five curators and three generations across three departments. Um, that's really exciting. Right. Oh, and so it's 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 cool. So there is there is a uh, and I think even COVID made it more um, made it more I don't know meaningful and and yeah. this this because the curator because the curators have been in in really deep think mode too. Mm -hmm. I mean, with their libraries, without other distractions, yeah. um, talking to each other. So it's it, it's been great that part. Very exciting. I just had the great pleasure of reading this article by Dana Goodyear on Peter Sumter. <laughs> <laughs> what made you decide to choose him? Because I don't think there was a process. I mean, there was not a competition, right? I think you just decided that he was the one pretty early. Well, there's, yeah, there's been a lot made of that. That's a funny article because he, he uh, many people have had many opinions about Dana's article. She's a very good writer, a poet, a writer, very interesting uh, a writer. But um, Peter, um, so, so the idea was we actually, it was complicated because the competition was already run, won, was already won in 2001 by Rem Coolhouse, who proposed the similar idea, replace mm -hmm. the old buildings because they needed to be replaced. So there'd been a lot of discussion on the board before I got there. Mm -hmm. And that competition winner project failed. They didn't raise the money. So mm -hmm. when I arrived at LACMA, it's an awesome responsibility. Okay, they just tried this and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So we spoke with the trustees, we spoke with the county, and there were a lot of proposals on the table because it was daunting. One, we did look again at restoring the buildings mm -hmm. because you have to, and we got a doctor's second opinion, if you will, on that. Um, we looked at the Rem Coolhouse scheme again, and I, he's an amazing architect, and we looked at whether, as time had gone, did it still hold. Renzo Piano was working on site, so he proposed some sketches. Mm -hmm. And I threw in a wild card for the board to consider because the museums in Bregenz and Cologne that yeah. Peter Zumtor had made are, so they're, 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 as he calls it, atmosphere. They're very emotional. And, and the thing about, they're made out of real materials, concrete, plaster, there's no paint. And I, I, I feel like for older objects of art, things that are ancient as well as modern, you know, sheetrock, the way we build buildings is a very modern material. It's mm -hmm. only been around for decades. And so it always sits uncomfortably with me. Whereas if I go in to see, um, um, you know, uh, uh, even like the, the, uh, the Kimball Museum or, or Carlos Scarpa's uh, concrete buildings and installations that this real material actually honors older work. And it looks fine, obviously, with newer work. So that idea of a concrete solid building also LA is full of temporary architecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter's whole thing is this light and shadow. Um, and, and so this ephemerality, and I felt for this program of trying to get deeper into a changing art history, mm -hmm. that this would be a, an interesting frame. So we let him study it, and then the board really loved it. And I felt the spark of energy that would raise, I mean, in LA, we've raised over $650 million to okay. do this, and that's n never been done in LA uh, for a cultural institution. No, so me. that was the, it was the, it was that passion, I think, mm -hmm. that sparked that possibility of achieving so much. Um, and so it's been a, a great collaboration. Yeah. So the, I remember the last time I was at the museum, um, there was the, the motion picture museum is being mm -hmm. built, right? Just as an aside, how's that coming along? So there's a famous story uh, when in 2008 crisis, uh, we, 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 everyone was, it was like now economically, obviously for museums. And um, the only program we had at LACMA that was not funded was the film program. So there was pressure from the staff and say, well, like our programs have support, we can't cut those. And so we temporarily uh, um, 
suspended the film program, I got a letter from Marty Scorsese yelling at me <laughs> about that. You know, he'd been put up to it. I called him. We had a big conversation about art and film in LA and why it shouldn't be a small program, but it should be a large program. That it should not just be like, we show old movies at LACMA. Yeah. We should think bigger. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to the partnership with the Academy um, of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And the idea that this 1939 good year Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, <laughs> May Company, former May Company building could be converted into the world's largest museum of, of cinema. And mm -hmm. so that has taken place. It was a collaboration between us. Um, Renzo Piano, who did the two buildings next door, is, has designed that. It's ready to open in the spring. It has a thousand seat. The world's best movie theater is going to be there. Small mm -hmm. movie theater, exhibition space, education space. And so the idea is at the center of LA. Um, you may know we every year we have not this year, an art and film gala honoring an artist and a filmmaker. And we're so this, all going to be there, please. <laughs> yeah, well, we're not even going to even try virtually right now. But the, this idea of these two communities in LA, and of course, that event then it attracted a lot of music and design. And so part of the idea was to create a campus, not just for, I think, visitors, but for the creative community, for the artists themselves, which are so prevalent in LA. That was the idea of having the bar outside and having this exterior space so that it's a social space for creatives as well as for visitors. And that happens at LACMA. You would see a filmmaker and an artist at the bar outside as you were coming through. So that will open in April. It's, I, that's the idea. We'll see. Um, ready to go. And it's, uh, it's just super exciting. It looks beautiful. That's amazing. So I wanted to, um, I know we're running out of time already. I can't believe it. Uh, I have so many other things to ask you, um, but let me pick. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what will the community, what can they expect once the museum reopens and this amazing new building is built? What will be different for the community? I think, I think that I, so, so the, the kind of activist part of being mm -hmm an encyclopedic art museum <laughs> is that you know if you go back to the original ideas of the encyclopedia which you know really started the french revolution as you will that idea of a sort of equity of knowledge and come looking at science and facts uh, rather than propaganda um, it, this idea of everything or and also everything goes we have forks and spoons and you know textiles in our collection as well as painting and sculpture and i think this idea of laying this all out in it in if, if you want to look at a future which is more inclusive and more equitable, mm -hmm. then you really have to rearrange and think about how to rethink the past. And and like I always think about it, this one trend always sticks in my mind. You know, you will ask an encyclopedic museum director or curator, like, well, there's just, you know, there's one percent of the artists by women. How can that be? You know, it's crazy, right? Half the world's by women. And I'll say, well, that's the way it lays out in history. And my response was always, will then lay out the museum in a different way because it's just not correct or possible to be looking to a future, which museums are important for, to be thinking about what world we want to live in as well as what worlds have existed mm -hmm. without finding a more equitable way to think about. And so this idea of chronology, I mean, every, every construction is a social construction. I mean, chronology exists, but when you present, you can, there's so many different ways to present. I always say there's never been a better time in art history because it's like people have lifted their eyes up, they see further, there's so many possibilities. And so the idea was to create a machine that could indulge mm -hmm. um, those curatorial, those larger views. So I think you're going to find a, a very active versus a very quiet permanent collection. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to find a collection presentation that's very much about the many communities of the present. LA is the, one of the most diverse cities on earth. And so we are really rethinking the past in terms of the present and future. That's the idea. So you'll see a different attitude. Um, and as you may have heard, uh, we the, the idea is also there's been a lot of criticism of not even getting bigger. I mean, we'll have 220,000 square feet of exhibition space. I think that's a lot and you could never see that in a day. But the board and we've been talking about the fact that maybe we limit then LACMA to that big museum and that the future holds more of what we're doing and sharing our collections. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about that with other museums, Vincent Price Art Museum in East Los Angeles, Lancaster, but where there are aren't museums to collaborate with in greater Los Angeles County and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people without a museum, that we may think of breaking the museum into pieces, building other campuses, 
uh, yep. and expanding elsewhere, making investments in other communities. So with the collaboration of LA County, I think you're gonna see some of that before we open, that we're already gonna be changing the model, not just of the facility on Wilshire, but of how we distribute and share art in this huge community of 10 million people of Los Angeles County. So it's, um, it's a tumultuous but exciting time. And I, I think, you know, you're hearing in, in, in this summer, I mean, after this awakening after George Floyd's murder about everything and, and, and like the word systemic racism and being common now, like all before it was hard to talk about those things in, in popular culture. And, and now even it's so clear that people are asking for institutions that have been formed over those hundreds of years to, to just open up and rethink it all. There's yeah. nothing, it's, the, it's, it's, it's exciting. So I think that's the, you know, what we have to look forward to. And you know, Michael, it's interesting that you raised the issue of systemic racism and what's happening in our field in that area. I, I was actually gonna ask you, what has LACMA done? But it sounds like you've been ahead of the curve in, in many ways in rethinking your collection. So well, can you I, a little bit more on that specifically in the area of anti-racism and diversity and equity? So we all know we all have a long way to go. <laughs> like yeah. there's no organization on our scale in the United States or probably elsewhere that, that this isn't deeply embedded. And remember the idea of a systemic racism is that it's invisible. Yeah. like to a lot of people. So we're barely scratching the surface as I, of I think the awareness issues that are gonna lead to, I mean, of course, yes, we do unconscious bias training now for everyone. We've, we've come a long way in, in, in the way we think. But LACMA was thinking about that for the last decade and a half about how the program itself, what we collect mm -hmm. and how we present it has to change significantly. So I think if you've been to LACMA's program, and I won't go through all of what we've been showing, but it's it's a sort of attitude, a big attitude change. If you show up at any particular time, you'll see what's on view is very much in terms of the the the, the living diversity of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and then, then how do you deal with history? So these these things that you're going to see in the Zoom tour build, these are 15 years of work and thinking, and it's. The hardware is only one piece, it's the software. It's curators thinking, working together, um, talking about all these issues. It's, it's a big task. And, and since no one knows, they've never seen the future of equi equity has never been, <laughs> we don't know what it looks like because we've never seen it. So it's partly that's the thrill mm -hmm. is you're working towards something. So yes, I would say that, and you, you know, we, you know, between the Mellon and fellowships and we, you know, we now have a graduate program in art history, diversity focus that you can actually work at LACMA as a, with a, with an undergraduate degree and get a, some are getting free graduate degrees in art history mm -hmm. so that you don't have to take off time. Mm -hmm. The idea is to jumpstart the field, to get a broader range of people in our field. We all know this is going on, but the, you know, the hardest thing is how do you rearrange the whole museum to take advantage of those future scholars that are being trained. And so again, that was the, the idea was to think ahead a little and create a, an armature mm -hmm. that would be much more flexible for those curators who are studying now who are going to take our place maybe not yours because you're younger but my place soon oh, and that they'll have a they'll have a place to 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 be much more adventurous and and take those new ideas forward i mean you could feel the change in the field i mean just talk to curators in the generation or, or scholars in the generation of their 20s, generation of their 30s, 40s. There's, there's a lot going on right now. And I think we need to be thinking ahead to accommodate uh, those new ideas. Yeah, Michael, I'm so grateful to your, um, just your openness and your ability to delve into some of these issues. I think we're out of time in terms of my, of our conversation, but I do think we have a few minutes for some questions and I see them coming in already. And I want to bring Nina back in to help us uh, orchestrate that aspect of the program. Nina, where are you? But thank you again, Michael. I look forward to the day when I can be back in LA. <laughs> <laughs> Come now, there's a lot to see. I can I know. take you in on my staff badge, I, I think. I don't know. <laughs> While we wait for Nina, um, I, I wanted to um, also ask you, let's not, I mean, there has been some controversy about um, 
the, the amount of space and where will the staff be and a lot of that. I mean, how are you dealing with it? The other thing I've heard is that people are talking about crossing over the highway and how, how are you addressing these issues? I mean, I just you know, the, ask. <laughs> it, it's a little confusing to hear. So I think I've addressed that we, we're not apologizing. Like the, we, 220,000 square feet, you have to really imagine that space, how long it takes. Well, I know we're very, we're, we do. and that's just the galleries. That doesn't include restaurants, outdoors. That's just art galleries. We think that's a lot. And we have put our stake in the ground that our future expansion can be in other communities. Now, my successor may want to build more on Wilshire Boulevard, but this is a, it's a positive decision, not a decision under duress that we, you know, a financial other things. This is an idea of bigger isn't better in one location. Going over Wilshire is 50-50. Half the people don't like it. Half the people think it's the coolest thing you can do. So it's just going to remain controversial. Um, <laughs> until it's there. In terms of my picture in this, so across Wiltshire, is that where the La Brea tar pits are? Yeah. So, so that was part of the reason we were working with the La Brea tar pits and they wanted LACMA to back away from the tar pits, uh -huh. our, our colleague museum. And so with them, we crafted a proposal to use our space across the street so that we could back away, create more park space, more space for the scientists, and then use the property we had across the street. And the city loved it because it would be a kind of a landmark. Uh, so they gave us the space above the, it's very high. Like you can, yeah. it's not like a highway over, but it's very high and it's super elegant. So it's gonna be a big landmark right in the middle of LA. The whole roof is gonna be solar panels. It'll be one of the largest solar farms in LA and it'll be a nice symbol of that. So, you know, the, the and, and the other criticisms have been about, you know, oh, you're not gonna have your collection permanently organized with European art or this, yeah. you know, it will be too, because that's the way curators think. We're, we're just creating the openness to not see it in one way. Um, and we're proud of it, actually, of this challenge. So no it's, uh, so we think it's good. And the, and the building's paid for. So it's a, just a huge gift, uh, you know, $650 million of that. Um, uh, only 20% is public money for a building the public will own. So it's a huge amount of private money being yeah. gifted to the public. So, and the money is raised, yeah. so it's a good news story. Yeah, have you started, I know in the beginning of the conversation, we started to talk a little bit about exhibitions that you're planning or installing, even though right now people can't see it. What are some of the exhibitions that you have planned? I read about a Korean Nara, art. So we, we haven't been open, able to open this Nara show, the big, his mm -hmm. first big retrospective. And and just right now, we've just been working with Colleen Smith's show is, is it's on, the films are running, <laughs> the disco ball is sparkling, it's amazing, and no one can see it. And then we have um, we have a, a lot, a Vera Luter exhibition, we have a Doho Sa's work, we have a, and we have a kind of fantastic exhibition that one of my curators, it's called Not I, it's a, it's a mix of works ancient to contemporary, um, and it's uh, Jose Luis Blondet has been working on it, and it's under the theme of ventriloquism. Yeah. And so it mixes objects and the, that's a meta theme, of course, because because the museum is a ventriloquist. The museum speaks through objects. Uh, and so it's a kind of meta discussion. It has a sense of humor. It's playful. And uh, uh, well, we'll say like, there's some surprises that just landed in the show uh, from artists we know that are going to be kind of fun. So that'll be a fun show when we can open. A Korean art exhibition? We have Doho Sa's still on view. Uh, we have a beautiful show of Fijian art, the uh, Fijian art, Bill Viola is ready to go. And then we have a show of contemporary acquisitions um, of new recent acquisitions and gifts, just because people were asking, well, what are you acquiring? And so that's up to a lot to see. Good, well, well thank you again. Um, Nina, welcome back. Thank you. Um, thank you again to Sotheby's for hosting us today. And Nina, thank you for your continued partnership and collaboration with the AFA. Our I pleasure. think I have one or two questions still remaining. Um, Michael and I have been chatting. <laughs> so Nina, do you want to take it away? Yes, I actually am not able to see the questions. So um, I might I have one here coming up. Um, someone has asked Michael, what ambitions are central to LACMA's leadership at the moment? That's a big question. 
I mean, I know it's it it is a big question, but we we've, we've been tasked since we had to tear down our old buildings and rebuild with really rethinking what this animal is, this museum of everything, call it encyclopedic, call it museum of all times and places where anything goes, put whatever name you want on it. It's a mm -hmm. very big, flexible idea. It hasn't been deeply rethought for hundreds of years or since the 19th century, let's say. And so I think that's the idea is to see what it can be. And there is many questions as there are answers. And, and I just want to say this correctly is that we know there's a big field, but because of this change, because it's LA, LA has been an experimental place. We, someone, we do need to experiment. We do need to try new things. Maybe not everything will work, but I think that that sort of spirit of, it doesn't seem discordant that a big museum like ours can be both experimental and activist, if you will, without, and we don't have to give away our core mission also of preserving these objects for future generations and caring for them. Absolutely, yeah. Someone else wanted to know, and I actually love to know this, what have you learned from working with Peter Sumter? And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, during the well, collaboration. I mean, he sounds like a character of, in, in a wonderful, creative, special way. <laughs> he, he's a very, it's, he, he, so he's, I think he's the last architect that does everything by hand. Literally, <laughs> when he designs a building, he starts tearing up paper and dropping it and looking at, it's very much like an artist's practice. Uh, and he developed this notion, this idea of atmosphere, that the buildings are not about their design, but about the combination of light, this durable materials with the ephemerality of light. He actually has a very good sense of humor. And I, I have to say, you know, architects, um, you know, artists often come out of the gate, they're amazing. As young artists, they do world changing things. Because architects need to build, wisdom emerges with age. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen that in the history of architects. And so it, it is, that's true with artists too, but with architects especially. And so it's interesting to, you know, it's always interesting to learn, if you will, from our, uh, from, you know, the wisdom of those who have lived and experimented over a long period of time. So, and he, um, he still plays a good game of tennis. That's the requirement. And it's the only time I ever exercise, he comes to LA and he requires tennis every day. So... <laughs> It's my only exercise a few times a year. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I don't know. Um, what else do we want to ask Michael today? Any other questions from the audience? Well, let's see. Um, Nina, any wrap up thoughts from you? Just so interesting. I, I have to say, you know, it feels like 10 years since March um, has, has kind of unfolded on everyone. And, you know, it feels like the world is upside down. But but hearing your perspective, Michael, is, is just so refreshing and kind of a, a moving forward perspective that I'm just not sure we've heard in the same way in these last few months. Yeah. So I, I found it uplifting. Thank you. We just have to get open. Please, anyone who wants to write the governor of California <laughs> to say the arts are absolutely vital. They should be put at the tops of lists of things open uh, because it's so important to to all of us. And because I think we've we've learned that our field is so professional, so able to care for our visitors. And um, anyway, I think uh, we have so much to offer right now. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you again, Michael. Thank you so much, Pauline. Uh, thank you, Pauline. Thank, thank you, me. Nina. Thanks, Sotheby's, for supporting. And uh, uh, Pauline, I'll see you at the next meeting, I guess. See you soon. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.